Hello and welcome to Tal Capes, the podcast that covers film, television, comics, and games. I'm your host, Cody Nestor. Alongside me is my co-host, Todd Heal. Hello, guys. The video version of today's episode is available on YouTube. If you enjoy the show, please consider following us on your podcast platform of choice and subscribing to our YouTube channel. Today, we're talking about The Hunger Games, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. Uh, years before he becomes the tyrannical president of Panium, 18-year-old Coriolanus Snow remains the last hope for his fading lineage. With the 10th annual Hunger Games fast approaching, the young Snow becomes alarmed when he's assigned to mentor Lucy Grade Baird from District 12. Uniting their instincts for showmanship and political savvy, they race against time to ultimately reveal who's a songbird and who's a snake. Mm. I'm a flippy left now. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the Hunger Games, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes was released on November 17, 2023. On a budget of $100 million, a 45 to $50 million opening is expected at time of recording. It has a Rotten Tomatoes score of 60% and an audience score of 90%. Let's talk non-spoilers. So, Todd, what did you think of The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes? Uh, you know, I actually I kind of enjoyed this movie. Uh, you know, I didn't hate it. I mm -hmm. didn't love it. But you know, I, I'm kind of glad we saw it. Yeah, it's a good watch. I would say, like I, I'm like you. I it, I wasn't too high on it, and I wasn't very low on it. I thought it was like a good kind of decent, enjoyable mm -hmm. film. Um, it was something. You know, we'll kind of get into it a little bit later. I don't know if I needed to know this story, or if I even wanted to know this story. Right. But I don't. I'm not mad that I now know it didn't ruin it and I'll, I'll I'll save my point later it didn't ruin anything about the Hunger Games or about right. the characters that have been established because you know over the last uh, couple weeks we've watched the four Hunger Games proper you right. know this is obviously a prequel I think it takes place 64 years or so before, before yeah. the Hunger Games the films that we watched but we watched Hunger Games through the end of Mockingjay Part 2 and that's kind of a series those four films that you know you kind of start Pretty high, you get a little bit higher, and start you go, sliding back you, down. You a little go bit. down a little bit, and this was kind of a, I would say, more of a return to form, a more enjoyable. What I liked about the Hunger Games was the the characters and the the Hunger Games themselves. Yeah, and you get that's pretty much what this film is. It's yeah, a lot right. of it's the characters and it's the Hunger Games, the focus on the games, and then also you get kind of the then you kind of it turns into a third act is kind of setting up and putting people in place for what they're going to be what they're going to be for the next 65 years <laughs> we'll talk about that uh but would you recommend people spend their money to watch this film todd uh i mean if you're a fan of the books and the uh, movie franchise you're going to do it anyway <laughs> but right. as far as you know general audience you know if you're looking to get into it you know i would watch the original four first uh, but yeah, I would recommend it. Yeah, I mean, uh, we don't know. We we're, we haven't read the novel ourselves, so we don't know how this compares to the book. So uh, if you are a fan of the books and you've read them, I think it would be another, you know, it's a, one of those kind of, uh, it's how am I looking and, and thinking about the film versus the book? What are the changes? You know, how does this compare? That's always kind of fun to kind of probably pick it apart a little bit as right. a, as a book fan of, Oh, it's so much better than the book, like kind of <laughs> thing. So, but I, I agree with you. If you're a fan of the, the hunger games, this is pretty much required viewing at this point. Uh, but before we discuss the film in detail, Todd, it's a time to play another round of how uh -oh. many stars. Yeah. So I have five audience reviews for the Marvels here, Todd. I'll read you a review, and you tell me from one to five how many stars you think the person gave the film. Once again, no half-star reviews here. So Sophia says, definitely a great movie. I'm such a big Hunger Games fan. This movie just connected the dots to too many perspectives of the franchise itself. I couldn't take my eyes off the screen, and every time I thought it would end, it kept going in a good way. It's a storyline of a character in the franchise, but it connects so well to what they become in the Hunger Games. And if you read the books, you know what happens in the end. How many stars? I think she gave it five. She gave us five stars. I'm off yes. to a flying start. Yes. Buffy says, too much singing. They could, have late, uh, they could have had less scenes with less music and made a greater impact. At times, I wanted to fast forward through some scenes. How many stars? Two. Four stars. Oh. Four stars. Okay. And there goes your good start. Yep. Albert H. says, uh, just didn't do justice to the original series. May have been best to leave well enough alone. How many stars? That's a one. 
It's a three star. Oh, I'm all over the place. Yes. And the wrong spot as per usual. <laughs> RS says, don't listen to the official critics. They probably use chat GPT to do their reviews. Just got out from seeing at the theater. This movie is an absolute gem. Very engaging throughout. The cast is each superb in their individual roles and together does the book and movie franchise justice. How many stars? I'm going another five. Five stars. Yeah. All right. Two and two. 500 here. And finally here, we got Mateo says, the movie was very rushed. If you didn't read the book, you wouldn't have a clue what was going on at times because there was no time taken to actually expand on the plot. Awesome movie otherwise. That's a one. You know what it could be? I forgot to write it down. <laughs> Are you serious? I to... It's a one and I win, folks. Yeah, I swear to... I'm going to give you that one because I forgot to write down how many stars that one was. And what was that dude's name? Wherever you are, we're sorry. Mateo, yeah. We're sorry, sorry Cody went to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah. He was tired. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Good job, pal. So now let's talk about Snow Lands on Top. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Todd, where, where do you want to start off with Songbirds and Snakes? I'm going to put it on you to start us off. So, uh, was this really necessary? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, when you think about it, uh, does this really add anything to the Hunger Games proper? Not really. Not really, no. But it doesn't hurt anything about right. the Hunger Games proper, so... Uh, I'm kind of glad that they didn't do the old chestnut where they go back and make him like he comes up from the districts. He comes up from, you know, you know, I'm kind of like he kind of started out, you know, as he was kind of. Yeah. I mean, he wasn't too far removed from like what we he didn't know completely as. change. I, I, yeah, I thought that's probably what we were getting. Like he was he started off as a good guy. Yeah. He was just a hardworking good guy and some drag from district, whatever, <laughs> did something and, you know, rebel scum. And he hates everybody from, you know, all the districts and district 12, especially. Yeah. But it's not really that he starts off, you know, kind of, um, you know, a little bit more less, you know, severe right. than what he actually becomes. But you can see that he's not too far removed from how he's going to be sixty four years later. Right. So I agree with you there. Like, did you have an imagined backstory for him in your head before you went into this? Like, if I would have said, Todd, what do you think President Snow's life was like before? You know, before right. the Hunger Games, we see the seventy fourth annual Hunger Games. I kind of. You know, I mean, it kind of sounds, you know, kind of, you know, like I'm just kind of laying it up right, but it kind of plays out kind of like it kind of did in the movie. I figured he would be, you know, around the Capitol, maybe not as high up in power as we would see him, but, you know, he would be close. Uh, right. You know, it was kind of, a, you know, shocking to learn they kind of start out in poverty. Yeah, that's that's the thing. Like, the he start, his, his family's poor. He's, he's the son of Crassus Snow. So his father was a general. He died during the first rebellion with the districts, and it's kind of shown at the beginning of the film. Young Corio, young uh, Tigers, which we'll talk about, they're kind of searching for food. It looks like on a battlefield right out, you know, somewhere near their home of maybe a, a rebel versus capital attack or something like that or a district attack, and they're kind of pillaging for food. But it's set up throughout the film that, you know, I think one of the characters, Peter Dinklage's character, tells him when he's when he's kind of, you know, when he's a grown up, more grown up choreo, you know, that the, the Snow family doesn't have a pot to piss in. Right. And that's right. pretty much what is set up here is that uh, I figured he would come from wealth, and just be kind of like a lifelong bureaucrat and just work his way up through you yeah. know, being a game maker. But he he comes from from poverty, basically, is what's shown in this film. You see him at the beginning, uh, kind of when they're, you're looking around their house. Uh, it's not the greatest place. There's cockroaches running around, like that kind of stuff. But, yeah, I mean, that yeah. that's kind of the same kind of imagined backstory I kind of have for him. And another one I kind of was thinking, you know, and, you know, as we're saying this, you know, a lot of people may be screaming, well, if you'd have read the book. Well, yeah. You know, we've just watched the movies, folks, but I thought maybe we might get to see maybe the battle between uh, the, the capital and the districts, you know, that war. A little bit more. And of maybe like, he would start out as, you know, a soldier, maybe a general, you know, he, you know, he does some bad things in the war, becomes a very bad man. Yeah. And that, that's how he gets, you know, I kind of, I thought that would have been cool. I could see that angle, yeah. yeah. I didn't I didn't so much have that idea, but I do I think that's actually, you know, thinking back on it, that could be a cool angle. But yeah. again, maybe that's not the character again. True. Again, we're only going off the films here. You right. know, he's he's more of a he's a thinker instead of a fighter, but then that kind of 
switches a little bit later on in in the film that we'll talk about. Uh, But, yeah, so the Snow, he lives with his family, Grand Ma'am. Never heard, I've never I've never heard anybody refer to her to as grandma'am before, grandma. but that's what they refer to the grandma in this film. He lives with his cousin Tigress, which we talked about briefly in Mock and Jay Part Two, because she shows up out of nowhere. I think Katniss says she was a former designer for the Hunger Games. She shows up out of nowhere, and we talked about she's Snow's cousin in that video. Uh, here, she's like kind of front and center, and then their family dynamic. She's there with Snow. Uh, she's not a cat lady, right? <laughs> not, she's not a cat person yet. Yeah, she. I still, I still <laughs> don't know how we get from this tigress in this film. I still know nothing about her. Yeah, she's just kind of she's just there, you know. It's like grandmam and tigress. Yeah, I don't, I don't understand. There's no seeds that they're sowing about how she becomes a cat lady. There's not a quick pan <laughs> over, and they're like, "Oh, Coria, what are you doing?" <laughs> You know, like she doesn't like you enjoying drinking milk or yeah, anything. Yeah, she doesn't poop in a litter box or anything. <laughs> like I don't understand how she becomes a cat lady later on, but but whatever. Uh, but basically, the, the the setup, the whole premise of the movie is that um, Corio, he's the top of his class, right? Uh, he is. He thinks he's positioned himself to be the guaranteed recipient of the Plinth Prize. So it's like a monetary reward. Uh, from what I was reading. It was created by Strabo Plinth, if I'm saying that name on Strabo, Strabo Plinth, uh, during the 10th Hunger Games, which is what we see in this film. It's uh, at the time of the 10th Hunger Games. But basically, he's one of 24 mentors. They basically kind of switch the script on him a little bit. Peter Dinklage's character comes in and says, hey, you think you're just going to be handed the Plinth Prize because you got good grades? Not so much anymore. The games are suffering viewer-wise. No one's watching them from the districts, which is the whole point is to have the districts watching, to have interest, to keep the districts in line. But no one's watching. The capital's not watching, so we need to do something to kind of freshen the games. So we're going to have you, uh, U24, mentor one of the Hunger Games contestants that are participating in the 10th Annual Hunger Games. That's basically your setup here for, right. for the movie. And yep. he is the mentor. He ends up mentoring a girl from District 12, named Lucy Gray Baird. So she is, um, we see her during the first introduction, is kind of like at the reaping ceremony. We see her, she's kind of, she, her name is selected. She's walking toward, you see kind of a, a guy apologize to her. Oh, I'm so sorry, Lucy. Yeah, I'm sorry, Lucy. I just got a song in my heart, Lucy. <laughs> I'm so sorry I did this to you, like that kind of thing. And there's another girl, like you, she's got this evil bitch look on her face, like, ha-ha, I did this somehow, like mm. I made this happen. And then we see Lucy's got a little snake, your yeah, favorite thing. My favorite thing in the world, She's a got snake. a little snake she puts down the back of her dress. Apparently that's the mayor's daughter, I forget her name. But uh, basically, her name's get selected. She becomes Coriolanus' uh, uh, tribute to, for him to mentor. What did you think about the the lead actors here, Todd? What did you think about the, the lead actors and their characters? So you got, uh, I think it's, let me find his name here, Tom Blythe. If I'm not mistaken, yeah, Tom Blythe is Coriolanus and Rachel Ziegler as uh, Lucy Gray. I thought they were outstanding in these roles. I mean, you know, you're going to compare Lucy Gray, obviously, to, to Katniss Everdeen. You know, yeah. she's your, your, your major female lead in this. Uh, she falls short of Katniss, I mean, definitely for me anyway, but I still liked her. I still liked her role in this movie. And the guy that played uh, Young Snow, he was he was great as well. Yeah, she's definitely, she's not your, she's not your Katniss Everdeen type, and that's fine. I'm not saying that that's a negative at all, but it's, it's definitely apples and oranges. She's yeah. definitely more of a, she's got kind of a gypsy soul. Yeah, can you say gypsy anymore? I, I think is that one of those can. trigger words? Can we say gypsy? Did, did, I, just get us, <laughs> did I get us canceled? Uh, but yeah, she's got that uh, uh, traveler spirit. Let's call yeah. it that. You know, she's kind of a free, uh, you know, free spirit kind of thing. They they live in a, a covey, which I guess is that like a coven. I don't know. Kind of like traveling around, nomad style. Yeah, maybe, like that. Or? That's how they kind of live. We see later in the film they kind of live as like you know, kind of nomadic and kind of you know they stay around the district, but they kind of have their own little insular little group of like hippie, right. hippies basically. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I thought she was really good. Um, obviously, there is a lot of singing in this. Yeah, she is a singer, so. Yeah, I mean that's that's basically I guess how she makes her money, and that's how she, you know, she is kind of a showman, and that's kind of what sets up to make it perfect for um, 
choreo to kind of mentor her because that's the the thing that kind of captures everybody is that at her reaping ceremony is kind of broadcast and you kind of see her singing for the first time and that kind of piques everyone's interest because it's something different something we ain't seen yeah before that it's just a bunch of like little kids murdering each other in a circle no one really has a personality about it no one's really had anything to say or do or be entertaining they've just been thrown into it yeah, and if you watch her when she gets caught up on stage, and I think she sings first, and at the end she kind of gives that little that curtsy, curtsy just like Katniss. you see that curtsy again. <laughs> and I came in my pants. <laughs> okay, <laughs> this just in. Cody liked it. <laughs> uh, references to other films do that to me, Todd. Um, tell me about Lucky Flickerman a little bit, Todd. Oh, Lord. So I guess he comes from a long line of reporter Flickermans. <laughs> yeah, so I, I was trying to look at it and see if he was directly related to Caesar Flickerman, obviously the Tooch from the other Hunger Games right. films. Uh, it's not directly established that they're, like, he's not his grandfather or something. Like, yeah. he's definitely in that same lineage, yeah. but he's not, like, a direct, but anyway. So he's like not only the uh, reporter, but he's like the weatherman. And at one <laughs> point in the movie, he actually does give a weather forecast for the district. Yeah, during the broadcast. <laughs> during the games, yeah, yeah. During the broadcast. And he's got this stick where he's like flicks a coin up in the air. And it, I don't know where it goes. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was kind of hoping that they would like expose how he does that. Yeah. I mean, I know it's a film, but like right. in the in the context of a film, yeah. like how he does that. Because like we see him later. Uh, so... Once all the tributes are gathered together, you see them, um, they take them and just dump them in a zoo. I mean, yeah. So there's a capital zoo there, and they just take the tributes, they gather them all up. Corio ends up sneaking into uh, uh, the, the transport truck, but they just dump them out in a zoo. Dump them into a zoo. And uh, he's kind of there during his like first broadcast to kind of like, you know, introduce, I guess, yeah. the, uh, the tributes, and he does his little coin flip at the beginning of the broadcast, and it's like right at the end is when he catches it. Like, hey, hey, how you doing? Hey, how you doing that, pal? How you doing that? This is the, the Two-Face origin story. That's right. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so oh, that, that zoo scene, too. So I think it's it's a, it's a a she's a friend of Corio's or a classmate of his. I think her name is Arach. Rackney, something like that. I believe so. Something, something like along that. those lines. Forgive me, but uh, so there's a he's kind of you know starting to bond with Lucy and talk and and uh, and things like that. And his other, the other mentors are kind of picking up on what he's doing. And over the the course of the the first interactions with the tributes and uh, that that girl, she's there with her tribute. And you know there's bars in separating them, and she's like yeah. teasing her. With, like, a bottle of water or something like that, something to drink. And she just Mm -hmm. keeps teasing. You kind of flash to it a couple times, and you don't really know what's happening. And he's, like, treating Lucy Gray like he's, like, she's a person. Mm -hmm. And, but... The, this girl is like treating her like she's like a caged animal in a zoo, yeah. and I love that scene. That girl grabs the bottle from her, <laughs> cracks it open, and it stabs her in the neck with the bottle, <laughs> and and she dies. And yeah. it's fantastic. I'm like, it's yes, great. I'm here for this. <laughs> I'm here for this. Um, let's see here. So uh, I think something to talk about um, is we were kind of going into it a little bit, but let, let's let's go into like choreo with he kind of changes the games like you kind of see the seeds um of what becomes because we're talking about in the zoo like you know in this film they keep them in like a zoo they're just like they treat them like animals pretty much and then like you see that evolution from like them in like a zoo in this film to like in the 74th hunger games it's like they're in a tribute center they have training grounds right there's like careers you know, there's like kids from the district that make careers out of being in the Hunger Games. Like, so you see the evolution of like not only like the 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 how they treat the tributes, but also like the change that he kind of submits or uh, suggests for the games. Like he proposes um, to like the sponsorship schemes. You know, to get sponsorships to allow them to like send things, drop in, stuff in. Yeah, into. Um, he suggests that like uh, there was another one he makes about potentially changing the arena. Right. Like in this in this film it's just like a it's just like a, a, a literal arena. Right. It's just a circular arena where they have the Hunger Games and he kinda suggests that maybe they should start like changing the arenas and having more dynamics in it, which you see later on in the other Hunger Games is like big open outdoor arenas with cameras kinda everywhere. Yep. Instead of this it's just a little circular little 
arena. It actually had like turnstiles or something because you remember they yeah. kept going off. It was like except saying something like you know, thank you for coming. Or... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like you literally, it's like literally like a, a coliseum or a stadium where yeah. they have an event, and uh, but it's just like a little, uh, not little, but it's a circular arena, and they just throw them in there, as opposed to what you see in the Hunger Games. Uh, you know, the post this film is that these big, massive sprawl arenas. You know, with twisting clockwork features in the middle and right. like all this kind of stuff. It's Cameras like, everywhere. It gives you a good indication of like, and shows you like where the game started to like how they evolve, where they go. Because yeah. like they, they dump in some of these kids and they're like, one of them's missing an arm. Right. Like they're all dirty and nasty and filthy because they really just picked them up. They don't, nobody gives a shit about that them. one of them had picked up a bite from a bat and he's got rabies. Yeah. So uh, Lucy Gray's other, there's a male tribute and a female tribute. Her uh, male tribute com- uh, partner, is, his name is Jessup. She tells Corio, like, because he kind of, he's like, you know, he acting sickly, and she tells him that he kind of defended her on the train, like, in terms of, like, he watched over at night because there was bats on the train, apparently, mm-hmm. and he got a bat bite on his neck, and uh, you kind of see him later kind of develop, a uh, little start foaming at the mouth, yeah. get rabies and stuff. But, like, nobody there's gives a-, a shit about these guys. They don't give him no medicine. Nothing. Like, there's not, like, in the other Hunger Games, it's like, you know, these are our stars. They have stylists. Yeah, exactly. They like have it, that big parade through with all their outfits. Exactly. And, it's know. like you see where you see how much snow kind of had influence, like on changing the games to like what they end up becoming. Um, let's see here. Uh, so talk about the uh, the rebels and the uh, what they do to the arena. Yeah, so they're actually getting ready to. I think they're going to kind of have a little maybe interview session mm-hmm. with them or something. Yeah, they're going to. He's, he's, Corio tells uh, Lucy he wants her to sing. He, yeah, to kind again, of get some stuff for her. And some, gets her some a guitar. Acclaim, yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, right before that gets ready to hit, they, the rebels just bomb that, that Coliseum place, that arena. Yeah, they just blow the shit out of it. And he, he kind of goes back in and kind of like after the aftermath and kind of looks at it and like. All right, here's how the landscape has changed and kind of tells that to Lucy Gray. Hey, there's, it, it's exposed to tunnels underground. There's a vent that's exposed here kind of thing, kind of leads her to. Yeah, uh, like kind when of, it starts, head for that hole, go underground. That's what he tells her. They're kind of like Hamish telling yeah. Katniss in the original, don't go to the cornucopia. Right. Don't get the weapons, run. Run. Right. And that's basically what Snow tells Lucy Gray. Don't worry about the weapons. Hide underground. Fuck Jessup. <laughs> don't. Don't yeah. don't try to help Bat Boy. You survive. You survive. Uh, she, does she listen to that though? No. 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 She tries to grab Jessup and also almost gets herself killed. He also gives her that little. I think it was his mother's compact full of probably some of the most potent rat poison you'll ever find. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> within two seconds, you're done. You're gone. Yeah. It's kind of set up. Uh, we see another uh, previous little uh, tidbit scene where he's kind of sitting in uh, their their house again prior to all the game starting, and you kind of see a box of rat poison with. A dying rat beside of it and that kind of sets up he he does give lucy the compact but then that starts sowing those seeds for the, the snow that we know from the hunger games that uses, uses poison. poison and stuff like that yeah yeah for sure um she uses that compact later in the games to actually poison uh some water bottles and to t- talk about the drones in this film. Yeah, so uh, if you're familiar with the original Hunger Games series, you know they have those drones that drop in uh, supplies as needed for the tributes and need of these kind of, kind of, kind of. They're well, very these, good at their job. They're very good at their job. Uh, these drones, uh, they, they'll be they're sitting there, you know, watching the games and you know the mentors are there, kind of got a little console in front of them. They can just kind of touch what they want to drop in. Well. They touch to drop in some water, and that thing comes in like 75, 80 miles an hour. And just Wow! It doesn't care if you're in its it way. It could be hedgy. It could bust right on your face. It's just wherever that ball <laughs> It ain't going to land in one piece, probably. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, he uses, he sends about eight of them. Lucy Gray gets some. There's like yeah, a yeah. kind of a little faction that forms out of uh, this like short red-haired girl and some of these others. They kind of make a, a, a faction and a pact yeah. to kind of team up, and he sends... Corio sends about eight of those drones in to kind of a distraction to kind of let Lucy escape because she's kind of cornered and they're just like, vroom, yeah. vroom, it's almost crack. like they were weapons. <laughs> exactly. I mean, yeah, they, I think they, 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 they knock out some of those kids for sure. Um, but yeah, she uses that compact after there's, there's some water bottles left over. Um, and she uses that compact of rat poison. They're distracted by another girl who is, uh, um, 
who she's went up and kind of like she's kind of staying on this high yeah, pillar. Yeah, she's kind of on top of that pillar. And they're distracted by her. So Lucy goes and takes all the water bottles, dumps out the ones that survive, dumps those out on the ground and leaves one, but poisons, poisons it with the uh, the rat poison. Yep. And who drinks it, Todd? Tuberculosis on legs. Yeah, the, the girl that... Uh... Flickerman describes as tuberculosis on legs. Best folks. line in the whole film. <laughs> He's doing his little report, and there's this like poor little girl from whatever she's so district, sick and she's sickly, and she's coughing, and she just looks so pitiful. And he calls her tuberculosis on legs. Wow, it's the funniest line in the film. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so she drinks it. Of course, the unintended consequence of Lucy poisoning that she gets poisoned and she gets killed. Her other tribute, um, I forget his name, but he he's kind of enraged by it. He takes all the bodies of all the fallen so far, kind of puts them all together under that pillar, puts a, takes, you know, drags down the Capitol flag, right. drapes it over them. Um, just, yeah, unintended, con- unintended consequences of the Hunger Games, pretty much. I mean, it's that's what happens, I guess. Something we didn't uh, mention, let's go back a little bit. Uh, who is Sejanus, Todd? So Sejanus, uh, I think originally he came from, I think, District 2. Yes. And uh, his family was well-to-do. They had a lot of money, so they basically were able to move to the capital and kind of pay for him to go to the college that Snow and the rest of his uh, friends are going to. And uh, you kind of get this feeling that the rest of the students outside of Snow kind of don't really like him. You know, he's just for money. He's only here because his parents had money. Right. Uh, but he's kind of set up that uh, he never really lost connections with, you know, kind of sympathizing with the districts and uh, even so much so that he tries to sneak into the games and try to help one of the tributes. Yeah, he's, he's set up as a rebel kind of sympathizer. Um, he sees what's going on. His tribute is killed very early on. Like they're all kind of, they have all the mentors in a, in a room once their tribute should die. You know, Flickerman says, you know, if you're, once, you're, once your tribute dies, get out. Get out of here. Uh, <laughs> so he leaves very early. He ends up sneaking into the games to kind of help. Uh, and I, not really help. He does um, – I think a character we haven't talked about as well is uh, uh, Gall. She is the the head game maker. Right, she's the played game by maker. Uh, Viola Davis, who does a fantastic job in the role. Yeah, her look is just creepy. It <laughs> is, uh, but basically, uh, he uh, she's kind of showing Corio that he snuck back in. He's doing like I think she says he's doing like a death ritual. Uh, like a District 2 death ritual. He, like, oh, sprinkles that's what something. it was. He was sprinkling something yeah. on that one, yeah. And uh, so she tells Corio, you know, you've got to sneak in and get him. We can't have this. They can't see it. It'll be kind of anarchy. Uh, it'll make a mockery of the games. So I'm, I'm tagging you in. You've got to go into the games get him. <laughs> Corio goes in. Gets him out, you know, he, uh, he pleads with him to get him out. On his way out, Corio has to use, like, a, 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 a basically a, a pipe that's got, like, some, like, debris on the end of it. Just has to beat some poor kid from yeah. a district to death. <laughs> Does it with relative ease, but, yeah, yeah, ends up having, on the way out, when they're scurrying out, ends up beating some poor little, uh, I think it's the kid with one arm, too. I think it was, yeah. How fair was that? That's not fair. That ain't a fair fight. Yeah, you're going to club me to death? I got one arm here, fella. Uh, but, yeah, so you kind of see that that seed sown. I think he even mentions it later. It's, like, about how it felt or something like that, like kind of that, like, you know, like, I didn't hate it right. kind of feeling or whatever. I forget what he says, but it's one of those, like, I didn't hate it kind of things. Uh, before we before we get into the to the to the third act, let's let's wrap up the Hunger Games here. But, like, uh, what is the Rainbow of Destruction, Todd? Uh, that is Your a favorite. big old uh, genetically altered tank of snakes. Yes. That the game master is kind of, uh, she mentions it to uh, Snow, and I think one of his little his classmates went up there with her. But she's kind of trying to take credit for Snow's work. Yeah, and uh, sh- she says, "Well, you know the the report that y'all sent to me is at the bottom of this tank of snakes. All you know got put in there by accident." Yeah, the snakes they uh, they they don't attack anything that they've had the Contact scent of. With, if they yeah. have the scent of them, if they get used to you then they won't hurt they you. They won't bother you. And she puts the report. So if the if you really did write the report, Miss, as you claim, yeah. then you shouldn't be hurt if you reach in and get it by the snakes. And so, you know, not wanting to change her story and live, yeah. this girl proceeds to stick her arm in a tank full of snakes, and, you know, she gets bit and she dies. Yeah. I don't, did, did they say she dies? I can't remember. Yeah. Did, did, I know she got bit, but she I don't got know if it's bit, fatal. And they, or... they inject her with something, and I can't remember if specifically if they say she dies or not, yeah, I may be she wrong. may have. I don't remember, but yeah. Either way, 
she learned a lesson. Yeah, you know, <laughs> don't don't stick your hand in a tank full of snakes yeah, of just, any kind. Just tell the truth. Ambition, uh, it, it's yeah. it's a good thing sometimes, but too much ambition uh, gets you hurt or yeah, killed. It gets you hurt or killed. Yeah, exactly. Um, so l- let's let's go into the third act here. So I thought the third act, um, basically. Lucy wins the Hunger Games. She, they, Gaul releases. She, she's pissed at everything that's happening. She releases the. Uh, there's a, another. I think. Uh, what is it that triggers them to be so angry? Is it an, another rebel attack that they get so angry about? There's a rebel attack that um, yeah, kills that kills someone in the capital. I forget their name yeah. because they show the broadcast that like, oh, so and so has passed away. Yeah, that's it. And yeah. it triggers her gall to be like, you know, fuck all of them. We're like, gonna drop these snakes. In. Yeah, we're gonna drop we're gonna the rainbow it. destruction. It, They're we don't, all gone. We don't care if there's a winner or not. So they drop it. Um, before that, Corio, before they they end up taking the snakes in, Corio sneaks into her um, to her lab. He kind of uses he was injured in that little fight with the one armed kid. He yep. gets like a swipe on his shoulder on the back of his shoulder. He goes back in and tells her like he popped a stitch because he actually popped a stitch on his own because he put some of like his blood and like uh, he put uh, he takes his father's like handkerchief. handkerchief. And he has, I think, what is it of Lucy's that he has? I think earlier when he had took her that sandwich when she was still in the zoo, he wipes her tears or yes, something. with yeah. that handkerchief. Yeah. yeah, he wipes, and it's got her scent on it. Mm-hmm. And so he sneaks that into that snake, uh, that uh, tank of snakes. And so when they drop it, the snakes go after everybody else that's left except for Lucy. So she wins the games, and then they send her off. And then Peter Dinklage says, who is set up in this film to say, we, he doesn't like Corio at all. He doesn't like the Snow family. He doesn't like anything he stands for. And he's out to kind of ruin him at, at any given time. And he tells him that they they he, they kind of present him with the compact she was using that he gave her full of rat poison the and the handkerchief and says, we know you cheated. Your punishment for this is we're sending you off to District, I think, 8. To be be a peacekeeper for 20 years, the peacekeeper is like the the military force of the capital, the guys in the white outfits. Right. You're you're banished from the capital for 20 years. You're going to have to be a peacemaker in some piece of shit district. You know, I hate you. I'm Peter Dinklage. Like, that's (laughs) that's basically. And then you get to the third act of the film, and, like, it just felt very different from the rest of the film that we'd seen so far. Am I crazy? Do you feel like it was a kind of shifted a way, yeah. like it felt a little different from what you'd seen before. And right before that, you know, you did not have to go backtrack, but you, know, you had that cool line from Dinklage to snow where there's some kind of noise, and he's like, you hear that? That's the sound of snow falling. Falling, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Because he feels like he's got him right where he he's wants him. He's got him right where he wants him. He's ruined him. But, yeah, it's definitely a tonal sh- uh, and, a, not, and a visual shift too, really, because, you know, you know, Snow's in the army now. He gets his buzz cut. He's he becomes on, Eminem. <laughs> he's got blonde hair. He looks hair. a lot like Marshall Mathers, doesn't yeah, he? Yeah, he's got very, like, very, very blonde hair, and he looks a lot like Eminem. Yeah. And he goes, you know, he. I think he basically gave uh, that lady, bribes her with the last bit of money he had to yep. go to District 12, not District 8, because he's trying to track down Lucy. Lucy. Because he doesn't know what happened to her. He doesn't know right. if the Capitol killed her. He doesn't know if she's alive. He doesn't even know if she's in District 12, but that's his best lead. And uh, he gets there, and... Uh, the dude that was his friend, his name's escaping me. Sejanus. Sejanus. Uh, Hugh Janus. <laughs> yeah, that guy. Uh, he's on the train with him, and uh, they both get shipped out to District 12. Uh, you know, he winds up finding her in like a dive bar kind of place. Singing. Performing. I just got to, I'm just, I love singing, Todd. She loves singing. I love me some singing. <laughs> <laughs> and it's kind of just, it's weird. What do you mean by like, what, just like. It just kind of becomes like a, you know, like a. I told I told you it becomes like a um, like a jarhead domestic drama. Yeah, it's, it it's, goes from like a Hunger Games film to like the third act is like like a military jarhead living out like a domestic drama with his girl, trying to find his lady, win over his lady, having bar fights, having bar fights, like getting into some like stuff, trying to keep his fin- friend Sejanus from doing something, something stupid. stupid. Trying to make a life. Hiding do, some guns. Yeah, do we stay in the capital? Do we go out and live free and be hippy-dippy and, like, do all that <laughs> stuff and live right. in the cubby? 
oh, but I want do I want to get back to the Capitol? I have an opportunity to get back at the Capitol that he's presented. But yeah, it really goes from like a Hunger Games film to like a domestic drama, like yeah. a, like and it like it's a tonal it, shift. Definitely. It really is, and I'm not saying it's bad. It's no. just like. Not what I expected from the film. I didn't figure we'd go that far astray from the Capitol. I figured it would all be kind of like political backbiting and right. deal making and like Hunger Games mixed in. And I never figured we'd go like f- follow him to being a peacekeeper and like, again, like trying yeah, to find little. You know, like finding little lakes secluded and jumping in the water and swimming and laying around together. Yeah. It turns into kind of a, you know, a love story kind of thing yeah he finds her in a meadow playing guitar at one point which i asked you i was like is that the same meadow that katniss and peter are in at the end of the hunger games mike and jay part two Gotta if be. it's not it looks like it how, how many, many other good meadows is in district exactly <laughs> exactly um speaking of like where he finds her in the lake and all that stuff tell me about swamp taters todd <laughs> so they're uh kind of laying there and this little girl runs up and she's got this bundle of something in her hand some kind of vegetation she's pulled yeah, it's up. like a it's like a flower but it's got some kind of like something at the bottom yeah like bulbs or something and uh she's basically like oh look at those and i think he's kind of like well what is that and she's like well most people call them swamp taters but you know i like or a lot of people call them catness and then you hear <laughs> it, it, it get, that little musical sting hits because so everybody can cream their pants. <laughs> that because so, the name Katniss was mentioned. Call that. It's one of those things. that's like it goes on a little too long. Yeah, because it's like oh Katniss, like w- w- this, oh this oh is, that Katniss. Yeah, this is gonna get them. This will get them moist. So like, uh, Katniss you know, Everdeen is named after a swampy substance that grows down yeah. by swamp taters. Swamp taters that grows by a lake. Katniss Swamp Taters every day. Every day. Don't call me Swamp Taters every day. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I got to mention this. So so Janus is he's still doing his rebel stuff. He he got his way, whatever, made his way in somehow with his family or something to get to District Twelve too. Right. You see him sneaking around, talking to the locals, yeah. trying to set up something shady. Yeah, he's a peacekeeper too. He's he, he's doing something. He's trying to like help the rebels, like um, you know, get up north and do all this stuff. And it's set up earlier in the film, but Jabber Jays, Jabber Jays. So <laughs> in the Hunger Games before, in the the four films prior, there's Mocking Jays, there's and there's Jabber Jays, mm-hmm. and the Jabber Jays were kind of shown to be just like you know they're in the forest. If you whistle or whatever, like. You know, they would just kind of repeat it or, like, you know, it would just kind of harmonize with you or something Maybe like that. Maybe a simple phrase or something. Again, I didn't read the books. Right. And it's, not sh- it not, it's not shown in the movies previous, but, like, apparently Jabber Jays are, like, VHS players. Yeah, they're like the dick to they're like from the Flintstones. Yeah, they're, like <laughs> audio, they're like audio recorders. There's like, actually a little remote he uses. It says <laughs> record, record, play. Click, so click, click, they click. have It's like a live animal. <laughs> That it's remote controlled, and so he's got like a, she shows him. Gall shows him one earlier in the film, but he they're like stacking jabber jays to send back to the capital or something. Yeah, and he's got one in front of him, and Sejanus is Sejanus is just, is revealing his rebel secret rebel plans. Right, and he's, he's like, oh really? Record click, <laughs> and then it's just like. I don't understand how the the how the logic of that or the internal mechanics of that work because he he so Janus walks away and he's like all right let me play that back and it's like the same it's like verbatim it's verbatim exactly and what we he were said. joking like like what if <laughs> what if the Jabber Jays was like what if like, like you said it was like a dick to bird in yeah. like Flintstones what if it was like a you know a, a gist a bird it had a it mind like, of its own hey, or something listen if you want to know what he said verbatim I probably got to get his beak wet okay <laughs> you want what he said exactly is yeah. going to Listen, I you know the nuts and bolts of it. I something rebels, <laughs> something with some guns. Yada, it, was, yada, yada. it was going up north. Uh, what do you want from me, pal? Huh? He's like smoking a cigarette. <laughs> like that's. Uh, but instead, they're like verbatim. Like yeah. they just re- it's they, like word for they word. They literally record people saying, and they can be remote control. They have a remote. That's yeah, cool. exactly. It, it it boggles the mind. An advanced carrier pigeon. Yeah, very advanced. Uh, but what springs the last few minutes forward of the of the film? Um, during Sejanus's rebel plan, uh, Corio kind of sneaks into the back, kind of overhears that guy earlier at the reaping ceremony that I was talking about. Was like, "Oh, I'm so sorry." Yeah, he's back there. Yeah, Billy Talp, Billy Tope. I think that's right. Yeah, uh, he is now dating that mayor's daughter, who is the one that uh, Lucy Barry put the snake down her dress right at the reaping ceremony. 
They're in on this. There's another guy named Spruce. He's another rebel guy. Uh, shit goes bad in that little confrontation. <laughs> the mayor's daughter says, I'm going to tell everybody about this because, like, he, she thinks, I guess, Billy still has feelings for Lucy because they were kind of a thing and in the band together. Yeah. And uh, Corio, she's walking away, and everybody's just going to let her leave, and Corio, like, grabs a, she ain't going nowhere. grabs a gun and just, like, pop. Cracks her right in the back. Right in the back, kills her. That guy, Spruce, that's uh, next to Billy. Billy's kind of freaking out. Uh, he cuts him in half with a shotgun, and uh, Corio's like, hey, Spruce, take these guns, hide them somewhere. Mm -hmm. And there was a lake or a, a cabin at the lake that they had used before when they were talking about swamp taters. Uh, and so uh, when uh, Corio and Lucy decide to run away together based on everything that's happening, and if they find those guns, Corio's good as dead, and right. everybody else associated with it is good as dead. So they go to the cabin, and lo and behold, what's there? Those guns. That's where Spruce hid those guns is in the under the floorboards of the cabin. That's what he needs. That's the last piece of evidence to um, that he needs to destroy to kind of make sure no one can ever figure out he had any involvement except for what time? Except for her. Except for Lucy. She knows. She remembers. And I'm like, how dumb are you? And she's like, oh, <laughs> he's like, oh, this is the last piece of evidence. And she's like, except for me. <laughs> Like, what, bitch? Why would you even, Why would you even say that? <laughs> Why would you even point it out to me that you're the last thing that could fuck me in the end <laughs> is that you could squeal on me? And he's like, you just kind of see the, 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 the gears rotating kinda in his head. Turning up there. Hmm. And then she kind of like, yeah, why did I say that? Yeah. And she kind of puts it together. And she's like, you know what? I'm going to go pick some swamp taters. <laughs> I'm going to be right back. I'm be right back. I'm going to be right back. Don't you go nowhere. Don't leave. I'm just going to get some swamp taters. And he's like, it's fucking raining. Mm -hmm. And she's like, I don't give a fuck. And so I'm going to get some swamp taters. I'm going to get some swamp taters. I don't care. They're better give, when they're wet. I'm, I'm going to get some swamp taters. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> And so she fucks off in the woods, and he's like, nah, she's nah, leaving. She's leaving. She's dude. not just picking swamp taters. She's pissing to fuck me over. So he goes out into the woods, and he's, like, looking for it, and he, he, she has a scarf or something earlier that's, like, kind of set up, and he finds it on the ground. What does he find under that, Todd? Another snake. Another fucking that snake. That bites him. Another fucking snake. Bites him on the arm. Kind of, you know, he kind of gets disillusioned with the whole idea. He, like, starts firing his gun, um, you know, just randomly into the woods. You see her kind of running through the trees. Yeah, he takes a shot at her. And she starts singing that song we've heard her sing, uh, Are You Coming to the Hanging Tree, which mm -hmm. we also heard in The, the Hunger Games. Right. Katniss sings it. But uh, he's kind of firing at her blindly, and she's just kind of running around through the woods. And then you don't know if he actually hit her. Yeah, you don't know if he got her. You don't know you if she got away. You don't know if she's, she's alive. You don't know if she died in the woods somewhere. You don't know if she's hit at all. Her fate is completely Left unknown, unknown to us. And then basically from there, he sinks the guns from the bottom of the lake, goes back to the capital. And this is where we get into my kind of big two points. He goes back, talks to Peter Dinklage. Um, you know, Peter Dinklage is like, hey, well, you did it. I, was, <laughs> I tried to fuck you over, but in the end, you end up fucking me over. You're back, you know. Uh, and he kind of explains that, you know, he was – he's – uh, co-creator basically giving games, credit yeah. him and um let's see i have the name here somewhere if i can find it uh let me see yeah i don't have it uh <laughs> but he, he created with this other guy and this, and he was like he was snow's dad yes okay. i think so yeah i think you're right i think you're right i'm pretty and, sure it was him and snow's dad snow's dad and he uh, high bottom, which is Peter Dinklage, like throws he threw out the they were drinking. He threw out the idea of like, hey, what if we do this? What if we take a bunch of kids from the district, and make them fight to the death? And mm -hmm. like, ha, 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 I'm drunk. And uh, Snow is like, that's a hell of an That's idea. a hell of an idea. And he <laughs> runs with it, and takes credit for it, mm -hmm. and so you know, high bottom couldn't like distance himself from it. So he's got a, he's got this like the moniker of like the co creator basically of the Hunger Games, and he's the only living creator of the Hunger Games left. And it's yeah. like he hates it. He secretly hates the idea of the games pretty much, I think. And so he's got, like, he's shown throughout the film to have a morphine addiction. And so what uh, what does Snow use with his old morphine addiction? So uh, he had got some morphine from, uh, I think it was uh, his friend Sinaeus. Am I saying that right? <laughs> No, right. Sejanus. Sejanus. I'm close, folks. You're close. He kind of had his effects, and he found some in his effects, I mm -hmm. think, and he brought it back to Dinklage. And uh, Dinklage, after Snow kind of heads out and on his way, he kind of, you know, takes a hit of the morphine and... Uh, 
he dies instantly because it has been poisoned. Yeah, he puts some rat poison in his, his morphine. And he throws a line back at him. I forget what it is. Do you remember? But it was like a snow, snow always lands on top. Snow always lands on top. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Mm. Suck it. <laughs> uh, but the last part of the film, and this is this is kind of where this is a problem with prequels and stuff in general. It's um, there's, there's twofold. Uh, you end the film. He comes back to the Capitol. He's got the haircut he'll have for the next 64 years. Right. He's got the clothes he'll be wearing for the next 64, 64 years. years. <laughs> he looks the same as he will in 64 years. Right. The character doesn't evolve whatsoever in the next 64 <laughs> years. He goes through this story and ends exactly where he's supposed to be for the Hunger Games the next 64 years. Right. So I always have a problem with that, with, with these prequels. It's like you have to be in the exact position like of where the other film starts pretty much, even though it's 64 years later. Right. But this man doesn't change his hair. He doesn't <laughs> change his style of clothes he wears. He grows a beard, Cody. For, yeah, for 64 <laughs> years, and he morphs into the, to Donald Sutherland. The other problem I have is what I call the Darth Vader problem. And, like, we kind of mentioned it before. <sighs> This is not to the extreme of the Darth Vader problem. The Darth Vader problem for me being, I don't want to know how Darth Vader became, became Darth, Darth Vader. Vader. It can only fuck it up. Right. And that's what happened with the prequels is that you have, I don't, I don't need to see him as a child. I had all the setup I needed for him and Obi-Wan's friendship in that little line where Obi-Wan's like, he was a good friend. Like that's, right. that's all I needed. Pilot. Yeah. That's all I that's needed all to know. Need. Like, it only made it worse. The backstory was only worsened. It's like I, I just saw another article too, to, uh, kind of on this article topic, that DC's about to like in Joker Year One d reveal the f definitive Joker origin story. Don't need to know. That's it. the whole like point of that character is that he has no origin. He's right. unknown. The more you know about him, the he less effect, chaos. The less effective the character is. Exactly. Now I don't think this is a, such an extreme example of that as like Darth Vader right. and like seeing him as a kid and like, oh, this is pod racing. You know? <laughs> right. And I'm like, you know, I'm a kid and my name's Anakin. You know, like I'm a person and my name is Anakin. It's not that bad. It's not that drastic. Yes, but like it's one of those things that like, you know, it's a creator problem, I guess. Like, what do you do when you've run out of ideas? Like, well, how did the people that we know and love, how did they get here? Right. And this isn't an extreme example of that, but it is kind of a little bit of a problem where, like, I, don't, I didn't need to know this story. Exactly. I didn't hate the story. It doesn't ruin the character. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't uh, upset me as much as, like, knowing Darth Vader's origins and how it was handled. It's handled way better than that was. Uh, it's handled better than what I'm seeing that they're doing with the Joker's origins. Like, right. but it's not needed. Yeah. And at the end of the day, I think that's probably my biggest takeaway as this film is I enjoyed it, but you don't need it. Yeah. And this one was probably helped too by the fact that it had an actual book it was based on. Right. This wasn't just Hollywood being Lucas Hollywood. didn't wor work up a script in like right. two weeks. Right. <laughs> when they were supposed to be filming already. Like this, this was actually on the printed page. Just so yeah. That. And like I said, I don't don't get me wrong. It's not it's not handled poorly at all. And like I said, it doesn't. It, it doesn't have the same problems. Like it, it was definitely more thought through. There was definitely more backstory and setup to this character. I, I'm, I'm sure coming from the book and the novel. Like, but again, it's not. I don't need to know it. Right. It doesn't. Does it change anything about Snow for you in the other films? No. It doesn't make you more empathetic to me. No. It doesn't. It doesn't like. It doesn't bring anything to him that I didn't already know or surmise. Right. You know when you see him in the Hunger Games proper. You know the, yeah. the four. Uh, movies that'll post this in the world, like I just it doesn't really add much to it. Got it. Yeah. It's like an interest. It's a, a tr intriguing, but it doesn't add much to Snow as a character. In honestly, right. And that's crazy because it's a movie about him and how. It, but it doesn't really add too much about what you see he does in the in the Hunger Games. Yeah, it's not something so drastic that he was like you know from a district and had to rise up and went through yeah. all this and you know he's. He's pretty much the same snow. person. <laughs> yeah, when he's when pretty you much, first meet him. Yeah, he he goes through a couple of things that make him a little bit. He already had a little tinge of evil. Yeah, he already had the capacity for evil. Yeah, and it just you see some little things to help yeah, him along the way. Exactly, but he's pretty much the guy. Yeah, you know, and maybe he gets a little bit more severe with age. But again, like I said, good decent movie. Just it uh, not necessarily needed for me. Right for my fandom. All right, Todd. Uh, anything else in the film that didn't work for you before we move on to final scores? 
Uh, I mean, there's nothing that really stands out that I was like, oh, my God, you know. Right. I mean, you're always going to be like, you know, those little callback thingies. But I think as far as those things in movies, the ones here wasn't too terrible. Right. I mean, they're there. There's some of them there, but they're not like, you know, God awful. It's not beating you on the head with, yeah. like, member berries and, right. like, yeah. hey, remember yeah. this. Like, it's not. Like, there is the little, like, Katniss. <laughs> right. Anybody. Yeah. But other than that, it's not too bad. It's not very fan service which I, you know, most of that would probably be lost on. Maybe it was. Maybe we were lost. Maybe there was a lot of things in the background or things people said that yeah, maybe because no. we didn't read the books or something. But right. for us, for film fan service, I didn't. there wasn't a lot of yeah. it. Didn't beat you over the head with it. I thought our main two leads were, you know, fantastic. I so, thought anybody in their roles in this movie did a really great job. Yeah, it's a good-looking movie. All the effects were really well really done. Really well done. Uh, Francis Lawrence, he directed the last three Hunger Games movies. He directed every one except the first one. Does another great, great job, job here. Yeah. S- music's good. Mm-hmm. Uh, overall, I mean, it's a solid film. Uh, so, Todd, uh, give us any final thoughts you have and your review score for The Hunger Games, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. Uh, so, as we've kind of iterated all throughout this, uh, did we need this movie? No. Do we have this movie? Yeah. Mm. Is it worth your time? I, I think so. Uh, you know, I think as far as prequels go, this one does a pretty good job. It's not beating you over the head with callbacks. It's got a pretty decent story, I think, based on it. It had a novel. And uh, my final score for this movie is a six. I think it's a decent, good addition to the Hunger Games series. Okay. Uh, I never found myself wondering how Coriolana Snow rose to power, but I did enjoy seeing that story play out on film. Songbirds and Snakes never quite rises to the level of The Hunger Games or the sequel Catching Fire, but I found much of the film to be more interesting than The Mockingjay's two-part finale. I give The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes a 7 out of 10, which ranks it as good. Todd, tell everyone how they can find us and stay up to date with us on social media. We are Talcapes on YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. Talcapes Podcast on Facebook. You can also email us at talcapespod at gmail.com. Also, if you're so obliged, leaving us a five-star review on your podcast app of choice really helps the show. Be on the lookout for this week's Popcorn Mumbles. We'll be talking about the 1998 film Godzilla. Talcapes will return next week. We want to thank you so much for listening. Until next time, bye, guys. See ya.